Good evening, boils and ghouls. Welcome back to another Friday Night Fable Fright with me, say it loud and say it proud, your old pal, the Collector. Ah, it's good to be back. I honestly love nothing more than lighting a few candles, putting on my Friday Night best, and turning on the old skelly prompter and trying to scare the pee out of you my wonderful Fright followers. And for tonight's little tale of torment, we are digging up and dissecting another tale from Night Frights. 13 spooky stories written by J.B. Stamper and published in 1993 by good old Scholastic. And tonight, I have a special guest star, Bob. Say hello, Bob. Rude. He's going to help us tell the story tonight, so without further delay, let's get into Cold Bony Fingers. Shall we begin? Thomas liked to walk with his grandfather in the high windswept hills that surrounded the small town where he lived. The hills were cut into strange shapes by the wind that had been blowing over them for more centuries than Thomas could imagine. His grandfather told Thomas about the ancient peoples who lived in the hills and were probably still buried there. Thomas listened to his grandfather's stories, but he didn't believe all of them, especially the ones about the dead people. Thomas wasn't the least bit superstitious, and his grandfather's stories were full of warnings about ghosts and evil spirits. One day, Thomas went out walking in the hills by himself. His grandfather wasn't feeling well because his legs were stiff and ached. Thomas promised to bring back a special plant that helped cure the aching. It grew wild in the hills where he and his grandfather often took their walks. Thomas set off from the town on a trail that wound up through the reddish-brown soil into the mountains. He decided to go visit the sheltered cave-like hollows that the wind had carved into one of the hills many centuries ago. As he walked, he was surprised to find so many rocks fallen on the trail. He remembered hearing the wind last night when it woke him from a deep sleep, but the storm must have been much worse than he realized to have loosened so much dirt and rock from the mountain. Thomas walked on, glancing around for the plant that he had promised to bring his grandfather, but he remembered that it grew much higher on the mountain, close to where the hollows were. As he climbed up the trail, Thomas hugged his jacket tighter around his body. The wind was still blowing hard and had cut through his clothes like a knife. Thomas started to run to stay warm. Soon he came to an overlook and stopped to rest. Below him, in the valley, Thomas saw his town. It looked so small and unimportant from where he stood. And suddenly, Thomas felt small and unimportant too, all alone on the mountain. He shivered and thought about turning around and running back home, but he remembered the plant he'd promised to get his grandfather and started back up the mountain trail. A short time later, Thomas came to the place where another small trail led off toward the hollowed out caves in the side of the mountain. He could see that the windstorm had been even stronger here. Loose soil and rock were blown into piles where they'd never been before. Finally, Thomas reached the base of one of the hollows. It looked like a dark mouth carved into the side of the mountain. He began to climb up a steep rise to its entrance, but halfway up, he came to a sudden stop. Right in front of him, on the trail, was a white object. It was so white that it seemed to be shining in the sun. Thomas stared at it in disbelief. He'd climbed up this rise many times with his grandfather but he'd never seen this skull before. Thomas stepped up to the skull and then bent down on his knees to study it. The skull lay looking back up at him with its empty eyes and grinning teeth. Thomas reached down to pick it up and just as he touched the hard, smooth bone, he remembered his grandfather's words. Never take bones from a dead body. Do not disturb the rest of the dead. For a moment, Thomas dropped the skull. He could still hear the warning note in his grandfather's voice, but now the skull was in his hands and he wanted to keep it. He could hide it on the bottom shelf of his bedroom closet and when his friends came over, he could show it to them. No one he knew had a human skull. 
The skull grinned up at him as Thomas carried it away from the mountain. He knew that the rest of its skeleton was buried somewhere nearby, and the grave had been disturbed by the storm the night before. But now the skull was his, and after all, whomever it belonged to was long, long dead. When Thomas came near his house, he pushed the skull under his jacket and then hurried into his room and hid it. Then he came out to talk to his grandfather, who sat rocking in a chair by the big living room window. The moment he met his grandfather's eyes, he remembered the plant he'd promised to bring. I I'm sorry, Grandpa. I forgot the plant, but I can go back and get it if you want, Thomas stuttered, suddenly feeling as though everything he'd done was wrong. His grandfather told him it was too late today, but maybe tomorrow he could go back for the plant. Thomas agreed and then went back to his room. He looked again at the skull, grinning out at him from its hiding place. Suddenly, Thomas wished he hadn't brought it home. He threw a sweater over it and shut the closet door. That night, the wind began to howl again. Thomas went to bed early because his parents had gone out and his grandfather had started telling stories again. Thomas didn't want to hear the stories. He'd lied and said he didn't feel well, but when he laid down in bed, it didn't seem to be a lie anymore. He didn't feel well. His body felt shivery and his stomach ached, and the thought of the skull in the closet filled his mind with an uneasy dread. Finally, he couldn't stand to just lie in the dark anymore and think about the skull. He got up, turned on the lights, and opened the closet door. He'd picked up the sweater that he'd thrown over it and saw the skull sitting there, just where he'd left it. It was still grinning at him, but now the grin seemed to have an evil edge to it. Thomas slammed the closet door and ran back to his bed, flicking off the light and covering his head with his blanket. After tossing and turning for more than an hour, he fell asleep, at last. Thomas wasn't sure what woke him hours later in the middle of the night. Maybe it was the wind still howling outside. Or maybe it was the aching feeling in his stomach, but whatever it was made him sit bolt upright in bed. He sat there in bed, feeling a shiver travel through his whole body from his head to toe. Then he noticed the strange smell in the room. The smell of something old and dead. As he sat there in the dark, shaking, Thomas heard a strange sound. It was the sound of things that were smooth and hard, clicking against each other with trembling hands. Thomas reached over and turned on his light, and standing at the end of his bed, Thomas saw a headless skeleton. Its long bony arms were reaching out and seemed to be searching for something. Then, from inside his closet, Thomas heard a weird voice call. Give me back my bones! Give me back my bones! Thomas shrank down in the bed. He watched as the white skeleton moved around his room, grasping out with its bony fingers. The legs stalked over to where he lay, and the cold, bony fingers touched his feet. And still, from the closet, came the voice. Give me back my bones! Give me back my bones. Then the bony fingers of the skeleton moved up to Thomas's head and felt his eyes and nose and lips. Fear choked Thomas's voice and he lay there, unable to scream, waiting for the skeleton to take his revenge. But the voice from the closet called out louder, Give me back my bones. Give me back my bones! Suddenly, Thomas jumped from his bed and ran to the closet. He opened the door and reached down to pick up the cold white skull. Its hollow sockets looked up at him, and its grinning teeth began to move. Give me back my bones! Give me back my bones! Thomas's hands were shaking, but he carried the skull to the skeleton and placed it on top of the neck. The skull turned its face to him and grinned once more. Then the skeleton walked out of Thomas's room. The next morning, Thomas woke with an awful headache. He rubbed his eyes in the morning sun and suddenly remembered the terrible dream he'd had. 
then the memory came back, so strong that Thomas began to tremble. It was a dream, wasn't it? He jumped out of bed and ran to his closet. He searched and searched, but the grinning skull was gone. <laughs> well, there you go. Now, if you want an old collector's opinion, the ending to this story had a lot of potential. That skeleton was just trying to get ahead in its own life. <laughs> it should have been Thomas's head. It's as if he woke up and hadn't really learned anything, or changed from his actions of taking what didn't belong to him. And while some of the tales we've traversed from R.L. Stein may be a little cheesy, they always end with the lead character doomed to learn from their mistakes, or being lulled into a sense of security that everything is right in their world, only to have it ripped away with some surprise twist. Not that I have any bones to pick with JB. That skeleton stalking around the room sent shivers down my spine. It just felt a little bare-boned, if you catch my drift. <laughs> what do you think, Bob? Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for tonight. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and ring that little bell icon to be notified of our next happy little haunt. And while you're at it, follow me over on Instagram at Old Pal Collector for more spooky goodness. And now, until we meet again, good night out there, whatever you are.